Financial inclusion has come of age in India. The equity cult is now mainstream. Ease of access, awareness and technology are driving the shift. And behind the scenes, money managers are driving this transformation. Welcome to Beyond the Boardroom, Business Insider India's special feature where we find out how your money is working for you. Sandeep, welcome to Beyond the Boardroom. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, as we discussed a few years ago, the equity cult is now mainstream. With over 10 crore DMAT accounts being opened, more than 15,000 crore coming into equity schemes on a monthly basis. Uh, could you take us through what's going on right now? Thanks, Mani, for having me here. No, I think this is just the beginning. I think I remember our discussion a couple of years back. At that point of time, the DMAT accounts were less than 2-3 crores. Uh, the monthly SIP was less than, you know, 2-3 thousand crores. And things have been changing. And I think this is just the starting, especially in the last 2-3 years. Post-COVID, if you see the DMAT account at that point of time when the COVID started was less than about 4.9 crores. And today's touch 10 crores. And even today, when we look at this, it's less than 6-7% of the population of the, of the country is investing in capital markets. But it's a great beginning. I think we've come to a stage where I think the domestic flow has become so strong. I think uh, when you look at the foreign FI money coming in, going out, it remains important. But the domestic flow is today able to manage everything. But what is more exciting is, you know, I remember having this discussion with you many years back. I mean, is this equity culture, equity cult only in Delhi and Bombay's? But the big change that has happened is, I think now the investors are coming from small cities and towns. I think it's unbelievable when you go to some cities, you know, recently I was in Tamil Nadu in small cities, people asking you, what is mutual fund, what is SAIP? I mean, it's becoming a part of the mainstream investing. But what is even more interesting is earlier, this money used to come from very uh, matured investors, elderly investors. So I mean, at this point of time, my daughter just started working. After the first salary, she tells me that where should I invest my first SIP? So I think this culture is changing and this is just the starting. That's an interesting point. I also remember that um, we had talked about the equity cult going mainstream with a lot of people from the beyond the big cities. I think you were uh, a big votary of that. Can you sort of explain how this whole equity cult and you've taken it deep inside um, in, uh, into the hinterland, literally into smaller towns, smaller uh, tier two, tier three, tier four towns. Can you explain how you sort of managed to go and sort of take the equity cult deeper? No, I think it's, I think, uh, been a long journey over the years. I think the entire industry, uh, uh, a lot of support from the regulator. I think we've gone very deep now in small cities and towns. I think from our perspective, if you were to see, we were one of the few asset management companies which were not sponsored by a bank. So effectively what made us, you know, I think what was very critical for us was to go deep into smaller cities and towns and educate investors. And that has really paid off well. I think it's surprising, you know, I think many times, you know, a lot of time people thought um, mutual fund is understood by very highly educated investors in big cities. It's a product for the rich. But I think trend is changing today. My driver is also investing in mutual funds. And you, as you go into small cities, you know, you go to northeastern states, uh, people are, you know, I think after bank deposit, I think I would say the most, um, the word they are comfortable with in, in investments is mutual funds. And I think I really feel happy and proud we've been a part of this journey in creating this cult in small cities and towns. You talked about your daughter, you know, talking about investing and that's a new class of equity investors, if I may say, so not just equity and they're new to equity. Uh, also, the fact is that gamification of investment has brought in a lot more millennials and beyond millennial uh, population uh, into the investment uh, environment. Uh, having apps, you know, which are the zero brokerage firms, uh, they give you a kind of engagement which perhaps some of the other uh, uh, tech platforms give you, right? Whether you're shopping or you're taking, hailing a ride. Uh, what about gamification of investment? How is that influencing investor behavior? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, the entire digitalization and gamification, it's changing. The new generation thinks very differently. It's not about what we say, what we tell them. They are going to do their own research. They're going to be taught very differently. So I think, so so the point what I'm trying to there to your question, uh, it's very interesting the way they have to be educated and this gamification is helping them to understand mutual funds better. Uh, and not only mutual funds, it's all investment products better. And I think they can connect with them. So I think I have a very strong view that I think when we, India is, uh, there are micro markets within India, 
every city is different every set of investors is different so again i'll move if i move from one generation to another generation on one side i have my daughter who likes gamification likes everything to be done digital uh, when she finds her you know which mutual fund to invest she'll do her own google research on the other side is my father a retired person you know for whom everything is paper even today so i think you he needs his advisor needs to discuss it he doesn't want to go online so i think india is you know there are micro markets so today for us as asset managers as money managers i think what's one thing is very critical one thing is to under manage money the other thing is also to understand the psyche of the investors how different people react how and how do you reach out to them how do you offer products to them how do you understand their needs and understand what excites them so i mean let me again give you another example you know i think when we go to different cities and towns now there could be cities in gujarat let's take gujarat is always known for equity culture now we see the type of investors who in gandhinagar uh, are very different from the investors who are in rajkot so how do you reach out to them how do you you know you have to customize so it's like my, my india is micro markets within micro markets and that's the way you have to reach out to people i remember you telling me that you as a rule in a day respond to investor queries do you still do that because there was a gentleman you told me about who had written to you how to plan for his daughter's wedding uh, do you still get that and how do you engage with uh, different segments so i think firstly manly again i'll uh, it's always a honor when somebody trust you with his money i think and it's a duty to do our best you know because it's not something easy nobody can will give, will give you your money i think you need to be we feel we are privileged that somebody is trusting us secondly i think is what happens is when we have millions of investors there are different type of investors who have different queries but there are a couple of investors you know query investor uh, notes letters emails whatsapp which come which really may leave a mark on you so i think firstly i respond to every query that comes to me personally i don't have any agency that works for me i think i feel that's the way i remain connected with my investors my distributors my employees on a daily basis i get at least in the morning about 100 to 150 whatsapp messages from good morning to what's uh, the what's your view on this but i respond to each message within 10 minutes so that's one thing but i think what's very gratifying is you know i think over the last 20 25 years that we've been managing money we get a lot of investor um, letters emails but some of the letters which have been really touching have been in uh, investments investments which were made by let's take a father mm, and uh, he passed away and 15 years later the child comes to know this investment was there and the mother used this money for the education or the spouse passes away it's required you know so there are some letters which come they are so touching and uh, it's many times you know you feel uh, this job is so great that we are helping people to take care of the future their lives and many times their own their next generation also so i think i personally connect with every letter every email every whatsapp that comes to me personally i do not neither anyone in my team responds on my behalf neither any agency you do that on twitter as well i i i'm very active on twitter linkedin i'm not only writing about markets for me i like sports i like you know recently uh, we planted 200 trees you know so my last tweet was about you know uh, planting 200 trees giving it back to the mother earth so i think i write about anything and everything and you talked about since you're talking about social media uh, there is an interesting trend which is playing out of influencers or if you may call fin influencers um who are driving a lot of content on their respective handles influencing investor behavior earlier it was you know investor education was a very serious kind of a stuffy uh, um activity that people very serious people undertook right and media played a big role today you have a new breed of influencers what's your view on them is it good for investors to follow them and do what they say or you know what's your take on that see again if you go back to history let's before the tech and the fin influencers you know go back they have always been influencers in our life which have created a positive impact so go back to historically could be martin luther king mahatma gandhi or as recent as um, you know i mean there could be various sports personalities various you know i think a lot of these at that point of time it was not pushed on you i think you felt that the someone is doing a great job uh, and i think you those things connected with you and i think the, you vibed in them and you were influenced by them right now with social media being so active there are too many influencers as long as these influencers are doing a good job with the right intent i think i feel they are doing a very good job for the society i think as long as they, it's not being backed by you know anything commercials or being told to push something for some commercial gain i think that is where i think we have to draw a line and i feel i feel in long run the 
end user is matured enough to understand you can get influenced by a paid influencer for some time but over a period of time you're able to see through so to your question i believe some of the genuine ones are doing a great job and uh, they are you know i think it is required because see what happens is it's very difficult for us to reach out to every individual now and it is not about only finance it's about so many other things you know i think i follow a couple of influencers of for fitness uh, and i think uh, i don't know them but i think some of the things that they tell you they, uh, they that uh, leaves a mark on you so i think it's good to have influencers as long as the intent and the content is right would you pay an influencer to sort of carry a certain story or you know inform people about certain things would you have you ever engaged with them no we have not right super money managers are known to be stuffy boring you're wearing a pink t-shirt you're looking cool uh what's with that i don't know i'm cool or not i think but i think what happens you have to understand every day when i there used to be time i we used to also be in coat and tie all the time i think whenever i used to leave for office my daughter used to tell me dad why do you all the time wear your black and whites and the blues you should wear something more colorful but that maybe that idea was 10 years back you know when she used to tell me but i think what is happening now i think what we have to understand is i think the world is changing around us i think our consumer is changing so let's not only me if you walk around the office i think a few years back we have made uh, the dress code as casual i think you can wear what you want i think it's only you take care when you're meeting an external person you decide what you have to wear you have to be appropriate so i think i'm not cool but i think I, what i'll say is i think what we've done is i think wear what you're comfortable with i think and that's the way because our consumer today i think again coming back to uh, investors who are e- of the age group of my daughter and others you know um they don't bother what you wear or you, on what you talk i think for them the intent and the content is more important so it's important to build a certain culture which is inclusive uh and therefore you know your dress code need not be as cast in stone as we used to be earlier i think i there there is always going to be learning if i look back i myself think why did we have a dress code that you need to be in ties all the time i think today i feel, i myself find it very suffocating to be in a tie unless and until i have to go for some very very formal meeting so yes i think it is let people i think be what they want to be let people be free let it be inclusive i think ultimately uh, our teams come to office to deliver and as long as they're delivering what they're supposed to deliver how does it matter what they wear so this makes it a little more casual i think you can walk into anybody's cabin i think the entire environment in the office becomes light but let me also till when i look back i think actually the productivity goes up uh, so i think it's a uh, I keep thinking when I talk to my HR head I think we should have done this many years back why did you do it in 3 years back The other thing I want to ask you is since we are on this uh, note of inclusive workplace policies uh, you again had told me about having bringing in more women um and way back you know uh, you talked about bringing in more women into the workforce you know how we, you, you have a women a woman fund manager if I'm not wrong and you told me that you know she she is an exceptionally good uh why is it that despite all you know bfsi still does not have the kind of women representation that uh, it could have had uh and what are you doing to bring in more women into the workforce so just let me you know make it a little take me back from home, office to home at home we are four it's three women and i'm the only guy so i think uh, that's the way it is at home when i come back to office i think we were a workforce for 16% women i think we have by design i think as a part of a target that how do you keep improving it i think we are nearly touching fair 20% and i think at the middle level also i think a lot of senior you talk about fund managers you know so both are um, one of our fixed income uh, fund managers anju uh, she manages one of the largest funds in the country and also menakshi you know on the equity side so we already have a lot of women fund managers to your question i think the trend is changing a lot a trend is changing a lot i think earlier uh, it would be you know you see would you see more men you know this uh, bfsa was dominated by men but the trend is changing is faster than what i thought and it's the way it's better it is and let me also explain you know one more thing i think my dealing you know starting from home to uh, work uh, workplace i think women are far better managers than men uh, do you see more women ceos in this uh, sector as well in the times to come 100% i think it's already if you see in insurance sector uh in uh, asset management company banks uh you see the finance minister of the country uh, uh, and uh, the regulator i think the trend is changing is changing faster than uh, than we could have been thought of so i think uh, when i look at a lot of my international peers i think things are far, in india are far better and uh, and every organization is making in that effort so i think that effort is there so even if you see i think uh, one more trend which uh, i have seen 
earlier it used to be you know when you looked at in the field uh, it used to be dominated by men but i think within our sales team also uh, we have very very highly motivated and talented women you know they're doing a great job the last 2 3 years have been in many ways has seen a landslide uh, change in terms of investors coming into equities because the rate cycle had sort of really um, turned post pandemic uh, interest rates were low uh, a lot of it brought in a lot of new investors into equity because returns in other avenues weren't as lucrative do you expect this to continue in times to come do you expect flows domestic flows to continue uh, given that the macro headwinds overall you know global headwinds there are plenty of headwinds whether it's prices rate cycle turning uh, do you expect flows to continue the way you have to see this what is the alternative i think from our perspective first let's you know i think when we talk of the macros both domestic and uh, international i think india is becoming better day by day i think in this entire crisis that has happened right now also the lot of actions being taken by the global central banks and look at the action taken by the indian central bank i think how well they have mal- ba- balanced the rate hikes and the growth so i think i am a very firm believer india growth story remains intact recently i think we've become the fifth largest economy in the world and i think there's nothing will stop us from being a 5 trillion dollar economy now coming to uh, when we took out to look at challenges i think i've been in this industry for almost now nearly two and a half decades every time there's one challenge on the other so only i think i'll rather you know i'll say there's not, never been a single day that i think we don't have a challenge and if there is no challenge some challenge gets created you know when you talk to somebody will say you know mujhe aisa lagta hai i think things are going to get difficult but i think what i have realized is you know first i think we have to believe in the india growth story uh number two i think coming back to the equity culture i think this culture the change that is happening in the culture i think it's not just a question of you know i think whether we want it or not there is no the alternative go back um just 10 years back um the fixed deposit rates in any bank one year deposit was also double digit today i think you're talking it's less than 5% now one thing you have to understand in indians always confused savings and investments and when you are getting double digit returns in your savings you say why do i need to invest and also uh, people like us in our generation were told that uh, equity is not a good thing stay away from equity gold mein laga do paisa bank mein rakho so equity was more like a um, a dirty word and that is changing so i think to your question what has happened in the last 2 3 years and also your opening that i think we have opened uh, we are touching 10 mera 10 la 10 crore demat accounts i feel this trend will continue there is no there will not be a u turn and one more thing what is very important is we have seen also maturing of investors so earlier whenever um uh, we used to see you know i mean markets crash and i'll give you a very different yardstick i measure you know so many times you know we see uh, how many redemptions happen that's the question will come markets are volatile earlier whenever the markets used to be volatile for less than 1% we used to get 100 calls in a call center at 8 o'clock what is the nav uh, kya ho raha hai you know because people used to panic now there's a 1% up or down it doesn't matter you don't get the calls in the call center also so people are maturing so this trend will continue i think and i am a very firm believer i think there will be a day every indian household will be a mutual fund investor and uh, this cult that is coming through the discount brokers also the new demat accounts all these investors are fungible these investors who are coming to the capital market whether they invest directly in stocks or they invest through mutual funds eventually they coming to the capital markets and i hope the day is not far away every indian household is a mutual fund investor that brings me to my next question that you know there are a lot of new to equity customers and if you look at an anal- analysis of the demat accounts which are being opened a lot of these investors are new to equity and they've only seen a one way up journey they have not seen a sharp crash and for the reasons we discussed earlier do you feel that their expectations need to be calibrated going forward uh and because when in the past we have seen that whenever investors have burned their hands with equity they never come back that's something that you faced uh, as a as a money manager uh sh- should you do anything or are you doing anything to calibrate uh, returns expectations no i think it's a very valid question i think this worries me uh two things you know first a lot of new investors came to the industry uh again whether investing in stocks or into mutual funds and a lot of that credit goes to work from home you know people were you know now they have gone back to their day jobs i think uh, what we have to understand investing is not a part time thing it's serious business i think you're talk- dealing with money so i think so what's important is basically the expectations and especially these two period uh, uh if i was to go back 24th of march 
crypto 2020 when nifty touched 7500 and after that now we are almost touching 17 and a half 18000 you know so i think people have just seen one way it worries me you know i think i hope these guys don't start thinking money making is very easy because you will have all the ups and downs so from our perspective i think we are doing a, a lot to educate investors that i think the the expectation should be moderated anything uh, mid teens i think is something that you should invest but more importantly uh, is also uh, that i think these investors have to understand because they made such quick money they took out money went to cash investing is about long term they were lucky they caught a trend but this trend cannot continue forever so uh, and i worry also you know because when five crore new demat accounts have been opened during this period where they have all seen just one good experience hmm? if something wrong was to happen to them i think it they may uh, be the not so happy you know uh, class of investors so i think as an industry we have to educate these investors and i think we're doing a lot right that brings me to the next question is a black swan event likely where the market is going given the global headwinds domestic issues price rise uh, geopolitical risks fed taper you know uh, the taper which is uh, likely to start so what's what's in store for the markets i think the beauty of the word you use black swan is something that you can't predict and uh, so i don't think so i think i what we have realized i think both as an investor and as an individual i, I think it's no, there are things which are in your control things which are not in your control you can't do much what you can control is how you react to them and i think what uh, my advice to investors will be you'll always have something or the other coming up but how do you react to that is going to be the key and the only way to react to this is no action required don't take action don't get into an action mode many times it's good to you know say that i think markets are going up i should invest more or markets are going down i need to redeem you know it doesn't work you have to stay invested many times no action is the best strategy and that has i think i've uh, been one of those investors who invested once i've invested i've never redeemed till i needed for some uh, some particular goal and it's worked well for me just ignore the sound around you and stay invested and it helps and let all this part what happens to fed what happens to oil prices what happens to abc be taken care by us and that also links up with the earlier point of what you mentioned a lot of these investors who were uh, investing directly you know buying stocks during this period i think you may be lucky once but you cannot be lucky many times that's a lot of gyan can you now tell us where the markets are likely to be headed in the next 6 months 12 months and for a longer period of time only if i knew the answer i would not be here you know i'll just put my all my money and just be relaxing by the beach it doesn't work like that so but i think broadly i think india growth story remains intact i think when you are growing at you know i think today 7 8% you know i think and today if you see all around you india is just getting stronger day by day so i think for me the way i see it you know i mean it's not about trying to identify where the markets are i think during this period also uh, if you let, let's again we talked right now markets touched a low of 7500 nifty in uh, march of 20, uh, 2020 and today we are about 18000 during this period also there could be funds or stocks which have not done well and there could be funds which have done you know very well so i think it's not about you know guessing where the market is going to be over the next 6 months 8 months you know. directionally are we continue uh, will we continue growing uh, i think answer is yes is india emerging stronger answer is yes and is there any other alternative other than investing in markets answer is no so i think so my advice to investors is going to be re remain invested i still remember the old uh, ad of one of the motorbike companies used to be fill it forget uh, fill it and forget it you know that's the way you should do i think just invest in this market and remain invested don't try to time the market hold back your emotions there will be in many number of uh, n number of news flows which will come which will make you jittery that i think uh, what is going to happen to oil what is going to happen to fed what is going to be what is going to happen to us uh, what happens to the war what happens to china i think have faith in your own country and keep investing very good point that you make uh, coming to this whole uh, trend of passive investing passive investing is very big globally uh, and that's a trend that has come to india a few years ago you've been a very big votary of uh, passive investing i remember at a time when the rest of the industry didn't even want to talk about it uh, can you talk explain uh, the merits of passive investing and what are the categories of people should come into passive versus actively managed uh, and direct equities so all these three options of entering equities if you can just explain 
So, Mani, if you, I think you're right. I think we were one of the first few ones to start uh, ETFs uh, in India. And at that point of time, I think a lot of my colleagues used to tell me, I think you, what you're doing is the wrong step. But I think I, we have always believed as a company that I think what is right for the investor you have to do. Now, ETFs, now I'm no one to decide whether ETF is good for the investor or not. I think it's the investor has to choose. I think my job is to keep offering all the products. And we are also a very firm believer, you have to be a good learner. Mm, I think if globally, I think ETFs are 70% of the asset management industry, there is no reason why in India uh, we believe that no, 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 I think it, it works in US and works in the rest of the world, but it will not work in India. So we are here basically, I think we are here to offer all the products to the investor and without only thinking about what is more profitable for us. That was the background for us to launch. And fortunately, when you look now, I think we fast forward four or five years later, I think we are about 80% of the volume on the stock exchanges. So we were able to catch that trend early. But now coming back to um, why ETFs? Now, we have to understand there are different categories of investors, matured uh, uh, young investors, uh, savvy investors, and some, some investors in the middle. Now, different investors will have different needs. Now, there will be investors who want to start their investment journey with the active funds. They'll come whether through SIPs to starting 100 rupees. There will be investors who will mature, who will move into, you know, in, uh, in, within mutual funds, uh, move to sectoral funds and others. And then there will be the next set of investors who are, I'll say, if the top of the pyramid, they'll say they'll start moving to ETFs. They want to do their own self allocation. Uh, they want to decide where they want to be. They don't want the fund manager to take the call. They say, I think I want to be in banking. I want to be in Nifty. I want to be, you know, in mid cap. I want to do whatever. They want to take the call. So these set of investors prefer going to ETFs. And also with the advent or with the coming of the new uh, broking, uh, come uh, these DMATs and various uh, uh, discount brokers, a lot of DMAT accounts which have opened these investors, um, some of them wanted to buy stock, some wanted to buy ETF. So I think effectively it is the investor who has to decide. But I think the more important thing is uh, if you know what you want, if you know what you want, I think then it comes to ETF. I think if you think that you need the help of, an, of uh, a fund manager to invest in the market, then it's the active funds. So I think uh, we'll continue having active, passive, and I think we let the investors decide what it is. From our perspective, I think we are very clear, different set of investors will have different needs. And I think we'll keep launching products and let them decide what is best for them. And we are no one to decide based on what is more profitable for us. Right. Uh, you know, uh, Nippon AMC also, you know, perceives itself not just as a money management company, but also a fintech because you source a lot of your clients directly. Uh, this is again a debate which nobody in the industry wants to have because you have your distributor community and you have the investor community which in large droves now wants to come direct. They do not want to go through a distributor. So if you could explain this whole phenomena of going direct versus going through a distributor, and we had done some back of the envelope calculations which show that if you've chosen the right fund and you've gone direct, the returns are significantly better. So if you could explain this whole phenomena of going direct, which seems to be catching on with investors, uh, and if you can explain that and how you engage with your customers. So I think what we have to understand, there are two parts to it, going direct and using an advisor. These are two different things. Uh, I think while you said that there's also a possibility, uh, I think uh, if you were to someone was to invest directly over a longer period of time, 5-10 years, there could be a big difference in return. And the reverse is also true. I think if you were to choose a fund which is direct, but you choose the wrong fund, I think then the returns could be even worse, you know. So it works both ways. So I think in this, this is not a, a binary thing. It's a direct or advisor. The answer lies in having an advisor who can help you to choose which funds to go for. So effectively, I mean, uh, it's not, if you go direct that you will not be using an advisor. I think I've seen very few investors in India who understand uh, the space so well that they know what, what is required because it's not just about uh, when we're talking of uh, investing in mutual funds, the portfolio is not just made of mutual funds. I think it's an asset allocation. There could be multiple other products. How do you ensure there's not an overlap? So I think so the answer lies in somewhere in the middle. Uh, yes, by going direct, you can save money you know, because the expense is low, but at the same time, you can also go extremely wrong. So it's important to have a right advisor, then let him advise you whether he sh you can go for direct or not. And I'm, I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of advisors have been advising uh, investors to go direct. 
and uh, the investors have been paying fees to the advisors also because eventually I think they are also uh, making a lot of money because of that advice. Right. My last question as in this format is basically that you know the industries act large cap actively managed funds have found it difficult to essentially beat the benchmark returns. Um, is that is that a sign of maturity in the market or does it show that you know ma fund managers are not able to create alpha? No, I think uh, it's uh, not a question of uh, the markets have matured. I think the markets have become more efficient. Uh, and uh, what clearly, if you re I remember uh, when we started, we acquired a Goldman uh, the ETF business at that point of time. Someone asked me this question that I think, uh, do you think uh, alpha generation will be difficult? I think at that point of time, uh, what I answered, I'm repeating the same thing right now. I think I don't see alpha generation as a problem. But if there's one category that can be hit, uh, which will be impacted, could be large cap. Um, because eventually, I mean, there is a limitation to your investing in the top stocks. I think the markets are becoming more and more efficient. And the, I mean, today effectively, if you were to see a small large cap fund, which has a fees of, let's take 200, 200 basis, 250 basis point, over a five year period, you're talking of about, uh, you know, 12% fees, compounded 17%. Uh, to create an alpha of 20% plus in a large cap fund, there could be chances uh, ETF may challenge this category before it challenges any other category. Super. Now we are going to do something very interesting with you, which is a rapid fire question and answer format. You will be, I'll throw a question at you and quick responses is what we are looking for. So is direct investment better or th an advisory route? The answer lies in the middle. I think you need an advisor to tell you where to invest because again, I mentioned earlier, if you were to go into a direct plan and choose the wrong fund, your chances of losing are very high. So it's important to have the right advisor who can advise you which direct fund to go for. If I'm a new to equity customer, should I opt for ETF or an actively managed fund? I think it's important to start with an active fund. Gold or silver ETF? For me, I like gold in any form. What is your relationship with money? I think money is important. I think money helps you give the freedom to do what you want to do. But uh, it's a love and hate relationship. You need money for your basic life. But I think too much of money is also bad. Tulips or mutual funds? Mutual funds for sure, even if I have, not because I'm a part of the mutual fund industry. When I advise my father where to invest, I strongly advise to go for mutual funds, not to go for ULIPS. I think mutual funds are far more transparent and cost efficient. Investing in India or investing global? I love India. No, and I think the opportunities in India are too huge. You know, I think no country can offer the opportunities what India offers. So it has to be India. One piece of advice you'll give to investors who are going into direct equity for the first time? There is a lot of thrill when you go in investing directly. I think uh, don't confuse thrill with your actual investments for long term. For thrill, there is a lot more in life. But when you're dealing with money, it's serious business, go for mutual funds. If you're not a money manager, what would you do in life? I'm a hardcore foodie. I would have opened a restaurant. What's your next big purchase? The new Apple Watch was launched. You know, I'm into running. So I love the fitness features in that. So that's going to be the next one, which I Apple Watch Series 8. Where do you go running in here, in Mumbai? The beauty, again, the beauty about running is you don't need, you know, un, you don't need anything, any place. You just need your shoes. So I think you start running on the roads. So I run in my complex. I go to Marine Drive. So one thing, even when I travel, uh, two things are fixed in my, you know, bag. One is my shaving kit, other is my running kit. It has helped me uh, to change personality also, you know, I mean, because running is something that's one of the only things where you're not competing with anybody. You're competing with yourself. You are just saying how you're getting better than compared to what you were yesterday. So that's the beauty about running. So before my every board meeting, every important meeting, I ensure that day morning I run. So I talk to myself. Thank you so much for joining us on Beyond the Boardroom, Sandeep. And we look forward to having you back with us sometime soon. Thank you very much, Mali. Look forward.